This is the Board of Directors meeting for November 21st, 2022 for the Clackamas Fire District number one. Welcome to our public. We finally are open for business. <laughs> and but uh, those of you that are video conferencing in, don't worry. We are not terminating that service. You will be able to continue to um, video conference in should you wish to do so. At Clackamas Fire, we are always here for you. We value our people and the people we serve. Our focus is establishing teams, trust, empowerment, accountability, mindset, and service. So the call to order for this meeting is pursuant to ORS 192.610 to 192.690, This meeting is being recorded pursuant to ORS 192.650. This is now coming to order at five o'clock. So the video recording of this meeting will be placed on the Clackamas Fire website. <coughs> no, ma'am. Agenda stands. Okay, anyone this. else want to make pressure? Nope. Okay. Approval of the minutes of the regular board meeting on September 17th, 2022. Does any board member have any comments or changes to share for those minutes? No? Okay, there being no uh, changes requested, the minutes for the regular board meeting on October 17, 2022 stand approved as written. Public comment at this time, I'm calling for statements from citizens regarding district business. Ariel, did you have anybody sign up to provide? We did not. John, you want to say anything? <laughs> okay. So if there is someone who did not have a chance to sign up prior to the meeting and who has a public comment at this time, please use your hand raise function at the bottom of your screen as we're video conferencing. If you're calling in, you can select star nine to indicate a raised hand and star six to mute and unmute. Each person will have up to three minutes to share their questions or comments. Uh, anyone attending in person should come forward now. So. Yeah, no, okay, no comments and no hands. Okay, so at this time, uh, Training Officer Captain Steve Sakaguchi will give a presentation on outward inquiry. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, good evening, directors who are present and also those who are joining us uh, virtually. It's an honor to be here, and I'm excited to share a little bit of background on outward inclusion. Um, <clears throat> We'll start out with, uh, I think we need to go to that next slide there. So the outward inclusion, let's go one minute. Mm -hmm. So the outward inclusion was part of actually a larger professional development uh, research project. We were looking at uh, some leadership uh, training and, and other programs. So those original quotes went out in about July of 2021 to eight different Firms. And of those, we had uh, four that uh, responded back when, and really one, which was the Arbinger Institute had a dedicated program to specifically uh, inclusion training. So uh, I want to apologize up front. We had some technical difficulties with the link that shows the video, Arbinger's uh, promo video on the outward inclusion, but Ariel is, is going to provide a link um, so people can, can view that video. So but essentially what uh, Arbinger did was they took a, took, took a pretty dynamic topic um, and, they, and they changed their approach. So rather than um, having a training that people often walk away from feeling isolated from the contact or from the content or feeling judged or called it out, <laughs> the program was really designed to call people into the discussion so that we could be part of the process um, and the outcome. So, the, uh, our master facilitator, who's also the director of, of DEI for Arbinger, was is Desi, Desmond Lomax, he goes by Desi, and he spent 20 plus years in public safety and in um, the corrections down in, in Utah, and then is also a licensed therapist, so he really understands the public sector mindset and understands um, how to connect us with that topic. So uh, we can advance ahead. And so on October 11th, uh, Desi came in and actually provided the training to us here at Clackamas Fire. And that was 35 people and two of our board members um, were part of that. And that the, the class 
um, consisted of people from all levels of the organization. And so board members, obviously we had our command and general staff that were present and then and then ranks and uh, from firefighter all the way through battalion chief and then our administrative staff also uh, participated in that. So with a with the topic of inclusion, we wanted to make sure that we were adequately representing all aspects of the organization as best that we could um, with that topic. And we again, we were limited to 35. Um, so we did the best that we could with that initial um, training. Um, moving to kind of the goal, one of the one of Arbinger's um, kind of trademark terms is that our behavior is driven by our mindset. Our mindset drives our behavior. And so our goal is to really uh, open up our minds to other people and our lived experiences. Um, we want to see people as people versus an obstacle or an object. And sometimes we can uh, behave or approach people in ways that we're just trying to get to uh, an objective. And rather than as people who have needs, have feelings, um, have other contributing factors that we may or may not be aware of. So uh, that's the goal of the program. Uh, we want to make sure that we're ensuring that our people are feeling welcome, respected, trusted, and they're valuable members of our team. The quote at the bottom is actually from one of the videos from the class where really uh, people with that outward mindset, they see people as people uh, that matter, just like we matter. So, uh, Moving to some of the feedback, um, and a lot of this this initial slide on feedback was gathered kind of organically through whether that was um, conversations that were happening at the end of the training, whether it was text messages amongst the groups, emails that were flying around. And so we can see just from these bullet points, you know, 40 years in the fire service, this was the best training I've ever attended. We had people who um, they came prepared to just learn you know, nothing new. We've all got to have our feelings on the topic and then walk away with this being a very um, different different outcome that they felt like they really got a lot of value out of it. Um, and then the next, I don't want to read every single one, but on the next uh, slide, we actually did a internal um, survey and we did a rating scale one through one through five. And as you can see on that, that far, far right columns, um, fours and fives of the, I think, what did I count? It was 13 people that replied to the internal um, survey were fours and fives. And then there was one three on how likely you are to recommend the training to uh, a coworker, but still high remarks. Um, some of those comments in there, um, I think one of my favorites is long overdue for this opportunity. Great first step with this topic. It has changed my outlook and perspective on our people. Please keep the momentum moving forward. I've taken so many, uh, so many and done for five years type of classes um, to check a box here and there. This was so much more than that. Let's commit to this and hopefully we can make a difference within. Um, and so what, moving to the sustainment, what participants got was a on, access to an online, online workbook and there's sustainment videos that come along with that. So we can revisit and watch those videos. There's uh, the course the course material videos that can be watched, but there's also the application videos as well. Uh, many of the participants actually receive the, up, like a weekly update of a new sustainment video that dives a little bit deeper <laughs> into the topics. And the next slide will show an example of that. So uh, moving to the next steps is uh, we want to look at identifying some of the internal facilitators. Um, Arbinger offers a train the trainer. Um, so using the next uh, couple of, of sessions to develop the train the trainers. And then we want to look at how we're going to roll this out to the rest of the organization and then build that plan where actually our internal facilitators will then co-facilitate with Desmond and that helps bring this big topic down to actually the, the applicable items for, for us. Like what is a label that we as Platinum Aspire would use? And an example that comes to mind would be, oh, your labor, your management, 
you're the board instead of using the names and recognizing people as people. So we can take this big topic and we can and focus it in on, on uh, how it actually applies here. So that would be the goal of the internal um, facilitators. And then moving down the road, I think it'd be a great vision to have that outward inclusion would be part of a formalized onboarding process for all members of the organization when they come in. That this would just be one of those topics in addition to the other mandatory requirements that we, we have to just provide outward inclusion mm -hmm. as part of it. Um, and other than that, that's the, that's the update of the huge success. Uh, we're excited to see where we go from there. Okay, any questions? Okay. Um, great job. First of all, um, I uh, I thought the class was outstanding. I thought Desmond was outstanding. I thought the way you and your your people that you were working with that brought this whole thing together did a great job. And uh, I do think that this type of training does have an applicability here at, at Clackamas Fire. So I'm looking forward to see what you have um, have in store for us in the future. Secondly, um, as a reminder for everybody, this was a big topic when we were doing the uh, chief's recruitment process of saying what the new uh the, the the fire chiefs that we were interviewing uh what their thoughts uh, on this topic was and how they uh planned on um moving the district forward with this specific item and of course any, everybody that uh, participated in that interview process knows that that was a, a big thing that the questions questions they had during the during the interview uh what we had and of course chief brown uh obviously took that very seriously and uh put into a put to uh, your staff has put in a great program. I like it. Um, like I said, I think it's got applicability to our, our fire district. And nice job, actually, nice job. Way, uh, way to way to go. That's that's what I have to say. They've been amazing job. Yeah, good. Okay. Thanks. Um, uh, Janet, you have any issues? I need to unmute. <clears throat> Steve, what? Who is Desma Desi, and what department did she work before we started this? DEI program. So Desmond Lomax, he's the he's a senior and I want to say they call him a master consultant. And he works at the Arbinger Institute. Um, prior to working at Arbinger, he worked in law enforcement in the corrections department at Utah and then is also a licensed therapist. So how long will they give the ongoing training, training the trainers? As far as how long and in what terms? Well, the training the trainers, what was there a term limit for six months, a year, or is there any, uh, can they be called upon any time as a consulting or just uh, one and done? Okay, so if I understand you're asking that uh, when we go do the train the trainer, what does that program look like? Well, the, uh, the facilitator, the, the training uh, arbiter group, the, yeah, so just, they so there's, there's a couple, sorry, keep cutting you off. There's a couple different ways to do that. We can actually either bring uh, Desmond back to teach us the train the trainer portion, or they have public, open public, um, open enrollment type trainings. So we could send our uh, folks down there to receive the training. And it's just a one day training. Um, or they do have a virtual option, but you know we've kind of thought a lot about the virtual, and our workforce hasn't quite made the shift to virtual training yet. Um, so I think the best options would be to weigh bringing Desi back with that group of facilitators, and that or send people to to Arbinger to receive that train the trainer training. But um, we're still in that process of, of working out that long-term plan and what that financial impact or investment is. So there'd be more to come on that one. Hey, Steve, real impact. quick. And, yeah. and once you're trained, mm -hmm. I think that might be what he's asking. Okay. So once you've gone through the train, the trainer, you become a trainer. Yes. What's that look like? Um, so great question. Thank you. Um, so you get certified as being the train, the trainer. You have access to monthly facilitator meetings. So they, they're big on making sure that it's not a one and done, that they're constantly feeding back in and providing any updates or any other um, training that you might need. So it isn't just a one and done. There, there is a recurring investment that anytime we would host an internal type training, we would then be purchasing the license for the online material or the hard copy book. 
And actually with the hard copy book, you get both the hard copy and the online. So, and those are right now it's a 99 and 109 uh, respectively for online versus hard copy. Nick, thank you for articulating that question. That is exactly what I was meaning. Uh, and good, thank you. Yes, thank you. Anybody else? Um, I will say too, I'll echo what uh, Director Croft said is that I did find it um, a very worthwhile program. And I have to say, I was not really looking forward to it. I agree with one of those things that's saying, oh, another one of these things. <laughs> But it really was different and uh, in a good way. And um, it opened perspectives instead of lecturing you and saying, naughty, 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 you're not doing this, that, and the other thing. And so I think you know, it was a much more positive approach. And I will say there was uh, a couple of participants that I think I cashed in all of my relational capital uh, <laughs> to, get them, to get them there. But in the end, it, it was great because I, and I think we just saw how much we've been impacted in the last couple of years. And so it was a huge success to see at the end, you know, as Desi's asking, has anybody, you know, found value and to look around the room and to know um, some of the people beforehand. And as I'm talking, some that came to mind too is actually, um, it was Wednesday, actually met with uh, the city of Portland with a handful of their recruiters, their equity manager for the Bureau of, of Fire, um and actually gave a, a very similar presentation uh to them this weekend so we have uh or not this weekend but on wednesday and so we actually have some plans in place to meet with that team of individuals again in person um they just recently had some training so we're going to share ideas um, but it was really cool to actually be able to share um, a couple of the videos from the program with the city of portland as well and look at partnering um, with them as far as recruitment and, and stuff goes. So, and that was set up through uh, Troy Lynn Craft, who's now a senior recruiter with the Bureau of Transportation, yeah. but it connected us with the Fire Bureau. So, yeah. So it's okay. exciting. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, Captain. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Business portion of the agenda B1 request board approval of Mark Whitaker as budget officer for fiscal year 2023 to 24. Assistant Chief Brian Stewart. Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, the request is a little different than it's a, listed in the agenda. Rather than uh, requesting mm -hmm. that the board approve or designate Mark Whitaker as the chief finance or as the budget officer, uh, I amended the, our request to designate the district's chief financial officer as the budget officer. Uh, there's a couple of pieces that I wanted to address with this that we've done, that would be a change from what we've done differently. One is designating the individual by position rather than by name. Uh, and the second is looking to uh, designate the person on an ongoing basis rather than just for one fiscal year, which is what we've done previously. So each year this board has seen uh, requests from the staff to designate different or an individual, Christina Day, repeatedly, Susan, repeatedly, uh, or as we designated Mark last year uh, by name. But I think we have the allowance under the budget, uh, under the ORS, to designate it by position and to designate it on an ongoing basis. So that's the request. Um, to make sure that we address it annually, I would also suggest that staff update the board of directors uh, policy manual next year. So it's reviewed on an annual basis. Uh, but that so that the board doesn't need to take action annually. All right. Um, board members? How does that work with Alpha Joint and Inclusion? Aren't we supposed to include people as people and not as. I saw you were looking at the website. He's got somewhere to go. He's got something over there. Uh, I'm just joking. Just, um, no. Thomas, you have your hand up? Yes, I did. Thank you. Brian, I'm sorry, I'm not clearly understood. Are you recommending A, this will be a position rather than a person, B, to the ongoing automatic position rather than going through the voting every year? Uh, yes, Thomas, that's uh, the, the both are correct. I'm, I'm looking to do it by position. So for example, uh, in 27 years, when Mark Whitaker is uh, allowed to leave Clackamas Fire, 
uh, and retire, we hire another chief financial officer, uh, that that individual would be uh, put into the budget officer role. And then again, that this would be ongoing. But again, the board would have the opportunity to review it annually as part of the board policy manual. Okay. Um, okay. The I have is what? Oh, I'm sorry, Tom. Let's go ahead and finish. Them yeah, I understood. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. The question I have is, um, what is the Oregon budget law? I know we were supposed to appoint a budget person. Is it okay to do it by position, or do we have to do it by name? So the 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 ORS uh, is included in your your staff memo. Okay. Uh, cool. There's no definition of. Uh, designating one person and whether that person is uh, by name or position what they're what they're looking for I think there is that there's responsibility to one uh, individual rather than uh, within like a city charter you could do it by a department you can yeah. say the, the, the budget office or the finance department is required is, is allowed to do it as a special district we're required to have one person right so right okay so but we can do it that way okay so we'll make sure that we're we're not muddy in the waters with the rules. I say we are. Um, I am prepared to appoint Mark for next year. I am not prepared okay. to meet to do this, and there's a couple of reasons for it. Perfect. Um, first of all, I would contend person means person. Okay. It does not mean a position. Second, if you look back in the definitional section, not in this particular chapter, but it's at uh, 294.3117. It actually refers to the word budget, it defines budget, which is used in that statute to mean the fiscal year. So I'm, I'm questioning whether we really can change this so that the board doesn't do it every year. Um, all we could do on the annual basis, I guess, is say, okay, um, we're not going to have the CFO. What if we don't have a CFO? What if Mark decides that he wants to give uh, Michael a chance and let him be the budget officer. That wouldn't be any flexibility in allowing there to be a training of a new budget officer, or Mark could be absent. And um, so I, I, I think it's still the for this year anyway. And we can look into it. Mm -hmm. And maybe you want to chat with um, our attorney who and be part of the problem with my past profession is that you become hyper concerned about things and I don't want to have happen is that somebody comes along later and is unhappy with the financial decision we made and said, well, you don't have a properly appointed budget officer, so you can't spend any money. You can't pay your employees. You can't do this because you didn't properly appoint the budget officer. So um, I, uh, for this year, I just like to do our standard practice. And if you want to further look into it and consult with the legal people. And, and then when we go to amend, if we amend it in September, October, whenever um, the board policy manual, you can make the pitch again. So that's, that's how I feel about it. Mine, I guess, is more motivational. Why would we do this? I, I think in, in reviewing and drafting the memo, uh, the concept of um, removing uh, one more not rote piece of uh, work for the board, but um, a piece that has historically been not, un from my perspective, not one up for discussion. It has, it has traditionally been an individual in a position um, and it was to look to streamline the processes that the board has to undertake. Okay. I mean, I, I kind of figured probably, and, I, and I'm, I'm not a big fan of doing things by rote. I think it was good, but I, I guess from a practical standpoint, I would say that so far, we've probably so far spent 10 times as much time talking about this as it would have taken <laughs> to say, how about we have Mark be the budget officer? We'd all say yes. And we want to address things to where we, are we doing a solution in search of a problem? I don't think there was any problem with the previous. Right? That's it. Yeah. I mean, I understand what you're trying to do, but I, I did too, because I'm enough of a nerd. I actually have a copy of the ORS on my computer at home. And I, I kind of went and looked and I, 
I have, I guess, the same concern as Marilyn does, which bothers me. I'm a green. I know. That's kind of a low shot, wasn't it? Um, but it does say person. So, I, I, yeah. It does not say position. Yeah. yeah. And it, so I don't know that it's that big of a deal, but yeah. I think both ways it's not that big of a deal. So if we want to look into this and maybe next year see it, is it really okay or is it not? But otherwise, I just move we throw him under the bus and leave him there. <laughs> as, as if I may, just you know, as as one of the things becoming a fire chief is looking at the way we've always done it, ways we can be more efficient and streamline sure. things. And so Brian has taken that charge. I appreciate you mm -hmm. doing that. We will look into it uh, for the upcoming year. And uh, if it is as we understand, we'll be bringing it right back to you because we do think it's a, a, a streamlined approach. But for right now, if you are, are, are good, we will amend to, to make the um, for this year. Bottom line, we're going to make Mark do it one way yeah. and then the next 27 years. And the next years, 27 so, years. Yeah. yeah, I would just like it to say 27 years, <laughs> please. That way he does not have to Until death do we part. Until death. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. there's, that. there's Jim. Hi, Jim. Hello. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I agree with President Wall. I think she made a real good point that the development opportunity, the ability of Mark in the future years to have one of his staff members take that on is a learning opportunity, I think uh, goes a long way. So it seems like a simple enough process, like Chris said, that appointing a person year by year seems real simple. So I would agree with both director, President Wall and Director Haas. Thank you. Anybody else, Thomas? Nobody else? Uh, okay, okay. I need a um, motion to approve Mark Whitaker as the budget officer for fiscal year 2023-24. So moved. Second. It's moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Ariel, please call the roll. Marilyn? Yes. Jay? Yes. Jim? Yes. Chris? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. Item B2, request board approval of MDC purchase. Chief Technology Officer Hicks. <clears throat> yes, he's zooming in. Yeah, he's right. There he is. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President and uh, members of the board. Um, as presented, <clears throat> information is there as presented. Um, to purchase the MDCs um, uh, via, as you can see in the information that uh, we had to do a slight change in terms of uh, how we have obtained them uh, because of uh, the supply chain issues that affected our original uh, uh, request. And so uh, the staff is just asking that the board uh, does approve and authorize uh, the fire chief to, to enter this purchase. Uh, if there's any questions, I would be glad to answer those. Board members, any questions for Oscar? Pretty straightforward. Jim or uh, Thomas? No, I no, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, then do I hear a motion to approve the purchase of Panasonic Cup books in the amount of one hundred forty-five thousand one hundred and thirty dollars and ninety cents from Technology Integration Group? So moved. I'll second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Ariel, please call the roll. Jim? Yes. Marilyn? Yes. Thomas? Yes. 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 Jay? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Other business. Board committee slash liaison report. Interagency committee directors Joseph and Steering. Jim, we didn't have any meeting before since the last meeting, isn't it? Um, correct. Uh, we since our October seventeenth meeting, uh, we haven't had any interagency committee meetings with any other agency. But I thought I might mention uh, that since our October seventeenth meeting, Sandy Fire uh, Board has had three meetings: uh, their board meeting on October twentieth, a work session on November third, and a board meeting on November 10th, just last week. Um, 
and they've had a lot of ongoing discussions regarding the contract for service. Uh, our chief staff has been following that pretty closely. And since our staff has been involved and we haven't had any actual committee meetings, I, I believe on OB3 on the agenda, uh, our staff has some additional information. So uh, we may comment on that. No specific meetings to report on. Yeah. Questions for Director Sharing or Joseph? Okay. Uh, Cognitive Emergency Services Foundation, Director Crafts. Uh, so we had the auction a few days ago, and it seemed to be light. I think Jerry will probably want to talk about that a little bit um, when it comes to that. Uh, we do have a meeting tomorrow. Um, so this tomorrow is actually our first meeting since the since the auction. So hopefully we will have a better update for you at next month's meeting about uh, the auction. Give you some more details about the auction and how it played out. Unless Jerry's got some um, information on that now. Uh, the other thing of note is that Kyle Gorman did resign uh, as the president of the board. So Jerry oh. now is uh, the uh, or is, uh, yeah the electronics are glitching here. So or the, anyway, the Kyle Gorman did resign from the uh, um, the foundation and now Jerry has uh, been officially thrown under the bus. Um, and so he will be now leading that um, that um, the foundation now. So uh, other than that, Jerry, is there anything else you want to add to that for the foundation specifically? Other than the fact that uh, tomorrow it's my intention to uh, nominate Kyle as a uh, honorary trustee <clears throat> so he has the ability to maintain some connection uh, with the foundation, which he's had for many, many years. And as far as the auction goes, uh, you invited to comment. I'll make it a uh, good time. Smaller than uh, usually, smaller than usual uh, by about 50% in the way of people. Higher for half of the in the way of bidding than we would have expected. Uh, the comment <clears throat> was made, those that came out sure bid their wallets out. <laughs> so uh, we didn't make what we would normally make. I'm, I'm not gonna start quoting figures yet because I don't have anything solid, but uh, we didn't come close to making what we normally make, uh, but it was a good time. And I think uh, we will be looking at potentially having an auction and maybe another fundraiser throughout the year uh, to uh, assist the uh, foundation. Question for Jerry? Go ahead, Thomas. Uh, I could not hear uh, completely. Did you say Kyle Gorman resigned from the board as well as the presidency or just the presidency? He resigned from, he, well, he resigned from the, the foundation, right? He resigned from the foundation right. and asked if he could uh, be appointed an honorary trustee, right. similar to the situation that we have with John Blanton. Yeah, okay. And uh, certainly, I, I enthusiastically support that, and I'm sure everybody that will be at the meeting tomorrow will also. Hopefully, we will have a forum of trustees so we can conduct business. Right. Okay. Thank. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Uh, future funding task force, Director Hodge. Um, since our last meeting, we've begun the public outreach on the, the possible levy, uh, November 9th, and also again on the 16th. The November 9th, we held a town hall at Beaver Creek Station out in that community, and the 16th was at uh, Station 7 in Eastern Happy Valley. I wasn't able to attend the 16th. I had a conflict that night, but um, I think both of them went real well. I watched the video of the 16th. Um, they went very well. We got some good questions, got some good information out of the people. Uh, we have uh, had follow-up meetings and found that we've had pretty good online participation and people that have interacted with the video. And we are kind of looking to possibly adjust how the presentation goes and, and maybe 
do a little more of the hard informational questions at the front. Um, and then the presentation almost at the back, uh, just because that seems to be the part where people are looking online, uh, the instant gratification thing in the world, people want to kind of get the answers to the answers that they want up front. So we may look at that at our next meeting adjustment, but, but so far, uh, I think we've had pretty, pretty overall positive feedback about the, the idea. Thank you. Any questions for Chris? Okay, thank you. Um, OB2, board informational updates and comments. Director Cross, you have one on the OFDDA. Yeah, is Genoa out there? Can you bring Genoa in? Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, we had the OFDDA conference um, last month uh, in Hood, uh, Hood River. It was uh, it was great. It was really good. It was really nice getting the conference back together. Not everybody, not everybody, not a mass. And we had a, uh, a decent turnout. I think 97, 96 people that uh, were registered guests. Um, the, the classes were really well, uh, was well attended. Uh, we had a lot of really great comments. Uh, I had the privilege of serving on a, um, on a board, um, on, a, on a panel with uh, Chief Stewart, Chief John Holmes from Ivy Fire, and Chief Doug Kelly from um, from Hood River, just outside of Hood River. He's, got, he's a, a fire chief of a, or administrative officer of a, of a small fire district out there. And we uh, we had a, we, we did a class on how to develop strategic partnerships. And we had a uh, sampling of uh, fire chiefs from a larger fire district, and a sampling of a uh, fire chief from a small fire district, or Ivy Fire, and a sampling of Doug Kelly, who used to be with Redmond Fire Department, now he's with a small fire. And it went really well. I think we had a really, we uh, had a lot of really good engagement with uh, with our audience, and uh, it was it was a good overall conference. Um, but uh, yeah, it was nice serving with uh, being able to do a class with uh, three chief uh, chief officers as well. So. Um, uh, Brian, anything else you want to add to that at all? Uh, I, I was there for uh, the conference, really, uh, for a couple of pieces with the OCA meetings and then uh, for the panel. Uh, what I appreciate about the panel that we served on about strategic partnerships was, I think there was about 30 people in the audience still, 28, 30 people uh, on the last day, which I think is always impressive when you see how conferences go and, and when it gets to the weekend. So. Um, but beyond the the attendance that was there uh, was the engagement um, from the audience, and I think uh, Director Jay, who was who was moderating for us, did a good job calling that out. But uh, there were some very distinct experiences that were shared, um, not just on our side when asked, but that they brought forward, which I think was the large part of the, the panel's goal. As we talked about what we wanted to see, we wanted to see the directors engage, and it not just be the exam the experience from the panel that we had, but the experience of the group to be sure. And I think we. I think we accomplished that. Yeah, it was, we had, I think we enjoyed doing that too. The other thing I wanted to bring up to the directors, uh, the four of you guys, uh, um, is um, the OFDDA and the SDIO has partnered together to develop what's called the Fire District Directors Academy. And this, uh, this is a, a lot of hard work went into this program by a lot of people to develop this academy. Um, and as part of this academy, there's several training topics that are taught by the OFDDA and the SDAO at the um, at their conferences. But uh, and also, well, let's just start there. Um, there are several different levels of this. Um, I've got this is one of the tracking worksheets. Uh, 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 the first level is power and protection, roles and responsibilities, representing the board, ordinances and resolutions, ethics, public meetings. Module two is public records, public contracting, local budgeting and finance. Anyway, there are five total modules on this. And once you have finished these modules, then you have uh, graduated from the, um, the Fire District Directors Academy. Um, and obviously a lot of these classes apply towards our, our, our insurance with SDIS and all the rest of the stuff. But it is, a, it is kind of a, a, a unique and different thing and also, uh, um, helps you kind of see some of the classes that are available to elected officials and to uh, to uh, to be able to take and to be uh, to be uh, learn to be better at our positions as as directors. Uh, also, as part of this, um, on here I have the uh, actually a print from the SDAO website right here, and it kind of shows um, a lot of other opportunities here. Um, uh, uh, what it what it's about, uh, so you can actually go to the SDAO 
website and look up exactly what we're what they're trying to do a little bit more um, in depth of what each one of the classes are and what they offer. Um, uh, I registered through the academy through Chief Stewart, um, and then the classes that I took at the uh, conference applied towards this. The other thing that is happening is. Um, uh, we as directors are going to be put into the vector solutions, which is the training platform of the fire district. And these classes are the classes, these classes that can be offered through the vector solutions platform, we're going to be able to log in and actually take some of these classes online. Um, so um, I'm, I'm going to have Brian speak to that a little bit more. But Genoa, can you help me out a little bit here and talk a little bit more about the um, the the academy and uh, maybe some of the little more of the details on that. I can, um, and I'm as you can see, I'm not at the office, so I don't have everything at my fingertips. Uh, Genoa Ingram, OFDDA. Um, so the directors, the board of directors for OFDDA, were uh, looking at doing a put or uh, launching. Um, an educational program that would encourage um, fire district directors to attend courses on ethics and public records, et cetera. And consequently, or coincidentally, about the same time, special districts was looking at the same thing. And they said, well, why don't we join and just merge the programs? And we had several meetings together and worked on the topics of discussion. Um, one of the things that I wanted to see that isn't there is, uh, for example, succession. There are a lot of fire districts that haven't worked on or don't know how to work on plans of succession. Um, that wasn't approved, but I, I hope to keep working on that and see if we can get um, other areas that um, would be helpful to fire district directors. It's a self um, monitoring program. Um, Jay sent me his credentials that for the uh, classes that he took and I scanned them and saved them, but um, it's, it's a self-monitoring program. And then um, once that you have completed, you'll have a certificate indicating that you've completed that educational course for the academy. And maybe Brian, maybe can you can share with us some of the details of how Vector Solution works and that we're gonna be enrolled in that as well. Uh, yeah, just briefly, there, there is a number of ways to obtain the training as one of them uh, is using Vector Solutions, which the fire district as a whole has been using uh, used to be marketed as target solutions that got bought out. So if that name sounds more familiar to you, um, I believe uh, Director Syrian is already uh, on our platform because he's maintaining his EMT certificate <laughs> through us. But uh, Redonna and training is going to make sure that each of you have access uh, to vector solutions. Um, and within that are some of the courses that qualify for the categories that uh, Director Cross mentioned. And you'll have the opportunity if you want to go in and take courses um, through there um, and it'll track what you've done uh, as part of that because there is a reporting piece OFDDA certainly needs to know that you've completed the requirements for module one or module two or both to get your bronze certificate those types of things um, so vector solutions is one opportunity to do it as director Krauss also shared he went to the OFDDA conference received uh, will receive credit for certain courses uh, the SDAO conference in, the, in February would have the same opportunity as would their trainings throughout the year if they meet that category. And they're usually designated on their announcement or in the, the conference brochure as, you know, OFDDA module one or whatever it might be. So, the opportunities there. And, and uh, I wait to hear back from Radana a little bit more about how we as staff can help assist the tracking process. It is evolving a little bit. Obviously, the curriculum is in place, but some of the course tracking, uh, Brian and I were talking about that the last couple of days about the course tracking and how we get SEAO, OFBDA, uh, and fire district training sessions together so that we know what we've done. And that still got a little bit of work to do, but but uh, but it's it's happening. So anyway, I just want to let you know about that, those, those opportunities, and uh, if, if any of the other directors were interested in, in doing that. When is rolling out? It's, it's happening now. Yeah, it's happening now. You can, uh, Chief Stewart has, can get you any of the, uh, I work with him to get this stuff. Um, and you can also go get this right off the, the SDA website and print it off. Um, I, that's what I did. I printed it off and then Brian, I don't know, I gave it to him and he worked some sort of magic over there and it happened. So I don't know what exactly happened there, but he said, just give it to me and I'll take care of it. So 
<laughs> you know, uh, staff will send out more information on it shortly. Any questions for either Genoa or? Um... Yes, Marilyn. Okay, sorry, Thomas. <clears throat> Yeah, my question, it could be Genoa or Jay. I don't know if you know, there was recently the, one of the fire districts in the state of Oregon was involved advertising on the fire truck for recall of the county commissioner. Are you aware of that? Oh my goodness, no. <laughs> you didn't know that? I did not know that. I'm happy that I didn't know that. <laughs> Uh, I, I just I wonder, able to sleep. You know, when you talk about ethics in the board of directors and the fire districts and getting involved in the political recalls, I'm just wondering, I don't recall exactly what fire district it was, but we can re, we can find out. But yeah. I, th I thought I saw that. I was chuckling when I saw that. Perhaps I could visit with you offline. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you shocking i mean it's surprising thank you i'm going to sign off i think i just burned my dinner <laughs> good seeing you Genoa. thanks General. i mean i'm here but i'm going to turn off my camera <laughs> okay. any other questions thank you ob3 cooperative services with sandy fire district this is the chief leader and we'll provide an update on all right well well thank you board um, where do we start? I think we have one slide. Is there a good for that? So uh, this is just one piece of a slide that we did for the interagency committee way back in September. Um, we did this for the interagency committee, which on our side is Director Joseph and Director Searing, and then on their side is uh, Director Monder and Director Jason Stickling, I think. It's Stewart. Stewart, yes. So forgive me for butchering that name. Uh, but anyhow, so we did this, and this came about through the interagency when we, when the study was brought back to us, and one of the options was to to expand the current IGA as, as we know it. So this we labeled as the contract for improved public safety. And it's a from Clackamas Fire. It's a cost neutral, and I'll just run down what what it would entail. And of course, this is no change to the current staffing model at Station 18. If this were to be a, to become a, a contract. So, and a lot of this they're already getting through the current IGAs, but this would expand it a little bit more. So effective response force on all calls, uh, all special responses, the, the fire chief and two assistants, uh, public information officer, website and social media management, health and wellness, program community services, public education, Fleet services, that's all vehicles. They currently don't have all of them done through us. Logistics would be all needs, facility maintenance, fire marshal service, wildland programs, which to include crew 30, and then uh, volunteer program oversight, IT services, training, and financial services. So uh, in November, on November 3rd, the fire chief and I attended a work session for Sandy Fire where uh, they asked us for uh, to bring a, a concept of what a contract would entail. This is what we presented along with a comparison of what they are today and what we are today as far as our agencies go. And then what would it look like together, which would, would be similar to this. From that work session, uh, they did sort of a, a soft ask for a contract. Steve? Uh, yes. We didn't change the slide uh, on the Oh, I only, I only have one slide, Thomas. Oh, okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, so they asked sort of softly for what a contract would, would look, what, what do they get, so to speak. Uh, and then um, November 10th, they held a board meeting where they officially asked and had their fire chief contact um, Chief Brown. So tonight, I guess it would be, we would ask for consensus from this board. If you approve us to do the work and to put together a contract for service, a draft, sorry, thank you, a draft contract for service. That's what we would be looking for direction on that. And if the interagency members had anything to add, I know that was kind of quick, but that's what we're looking for. Go ahead, Jim. Um, I think. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I think, uh, as we all know, Sandy continues to be a great partner with Clackamas 
the joint staffing of Station 18 that we embarked on uh, in cooperation with Sandy clearly is good for our citizens. Um, I think uh, to me, it's, it's obvious that it's worth looking at. Uh, the, uh, the proposal would ensure, as Steve mentioned, that number one, Station 18 would fully be staffed with three permanent or continuing as long as we're in that contract. Uh, some of the preliminary work that our chiefs have done also uh, there's the potential of the staffing at Sandy could be five by day and three at night. So the permanent staffing would be, could be three by day, five at night. Well, that clearly is a benefit for us. Uh, it ensures the battalion chief for the East Battalion would be able to continue. So you put all that together and that's almost a full effective response force for the East. So for Boring and Eagle Creek, we would have almost a full effective response force for the first time in our history. So it's possible. Uh, in addition to, to other benefits, the volunteer program could be uh, focused in their Dover station, their substation. So I think uh, clearly to me, the feasibility study, which we both paid for, recommended the contract for service. Uh, sounds like Sandy has asked us now, what would that look like? So I would concur and uh, support the consensus to at least have our staff put together what that detailed draft contract for service looked like to bring back. So we would have the opportunity to see that. So I would support uh, Steve's request for consensus on that. Okay. So after our joint, work session that we had a few months ago, there was a lot of um, confusion, disparity between the consultants and Sandy's financials. And I know that they were gonna get back with the consultant and kind of iron all that stuff out. I never did help hear what happened. Do they, act? I mean, they said they had enough money to continue into the future. The consultant said he didn't see that. Where did we land on all that? Yeah. Oh. Go ahead and Nick, you answer that. Uh, so they did reach back out with the consultant. Um, they wrote a, a uh, Sandy Fire wrote an addendum um, uh, to the the contract. Chief Snyder uh, had clarified what they were looking at and what uh, and it's it's just all in how Sandy budgets. Mm -hmm. Um, they budget for certain items that they know they are not going to spend. It gets rolled over each year. Um, the consultant was correct in his assessment because it's in the general fund and could be spent. It's just how Sandy budgets. They budget for items that <clears throat> in a pinch they could grab from, but they do not plan to utilize. And so it rolls over every single year. Mark has done an analysis on their budget. Um, just turn a couple seconds over to you, Mark, just as far as whether or not uh, what we are saying is a cost neutral is truly a cost neutral. Um, but by all intents, Mike's Mark's analysis, us looking at it and what Chief Schneider has done, it all makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I looked um, at, you know, their, their assessed value and what they're, they're spending and also the, the projected services that we're, we're planning to offer. Um, and it certainly would be would be cost neutral for us. It would it would cover the the five person staffing um, three um, twenty four seven and the, the two um, during the day, as well as all of our overhead costs. You know whether that's logistics and fleet, um, the continued cost of of operation operating station eighteen, providing the BC coverage. All of that's rolled into that, and it it fits within um, the revenue that they're bringing in through through property tax. So. That's that's why we feel comfortable with, with that level of service that we we're thinking to propose. Thomas, yeah, uh, Mark uh, and Nick, you can correct me, Jay. In lay person's terminology, they were including that line of credit that we do every year as part of their budget. That's where the consultant got confused. They they intended never to use but 
they always included. So the consultant was confused about that. And we had that clarified. I don't think there was any concern. Uh, we had an IGA meeting, Jim. Didn't we have an IGA mm -hmm. meeting after the consultant and the Sandy Fire clarified their positions? Yes. Mm -hmm. So it was cleared. Uh, it's just a, you know, six or half a dozen, they were just describing in a different way. In Texas, they call it differently than in o Sandy, Oregon. That was only, and, and I'm glad Mark had a time to look into it and clarified what they were saying is what they were saying. Uh, I have a question for one more question. Uh, I don't know if it will be Nick or Jay, uh, not Jay, Nick or Mark. This D shift that is coming mm -hmm. on next uh, in January, does that apply to the contract for service area like Gladstone and Sandy? Yes, if we do a, if, if after this draft contract for service, Sandy's board decides and, and the fire district decides to move forward, we bring forward to you and there is a contract for service, they would transition to D-shift as well. Gladstone Fire is currently on D-shift. It's just like everything we've done in the past, Thomas. If we do a full contract for service, they become Clackamas Fire contractually. It's not a merge. It's not a... Um, annexation is just a contract for service, but we are their provider, so they would become they would work. D shift would. So they will work in within our system. Whatever right. we do applies to them. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think Jay brought up a good question uh, about that discrepancy in the financials uh, from that meeting, and I had a question for. Steve and or Nick. Uh, so at this point in time, so Steve mentioned that the Sandy's board and chief walked through that and did an addendum to explain, you know, how they do their budget. Mark concurred that everything looks good. But so is the feasibility study now officially complete and released to the public? Uh, both agencies, I know it was kind of on hold for a while, but I wasn't sure of that I was just wanted to check on that. Yes, after after the board meeting of last month, it was placed on both websites along oh. with we we did post their letter as well. Uh, we got feedback from AMP that they were okay with it being posted. Everything was vetted through AP Triton, and so we did support them in their letter. And just uh, just a side note, I live in Sandy, and Saturday I got a letter from the fire department along with ten thousand other people that said. Uh, the study's done. There's a there's a letter attached, and here's here's what we've asked for, and we love your feedback. We we've asked them to sort of come and uh, maybe look at some enhanced services. So it's kind of a, I knew the letter was coming, but it was uh, it came and they wrote about it. So did you Just call as a citizen? From, what's that? Did you call and? give your feedback as a citizen? Uh, maybe as a representative of the neighborhood, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but th that's great to hear, Steve, because they're doing, it sounds like they're pursuing that outreach that Thomas in the very, very beginning said was going to be an important part of, of seeing this through to the end. So that's great to hear that they're actually doing that. Yeah. Okay, so um, thank you. I'm struggling with how this is going to be cost neutral to us. Sandy has three stations. They do not staff them full time because they don't have enough money to staff them three times. So where are they getting the money to pay us is for these enhanced services? I'm not, I, it, this better be cost neutral. There's no subsidy for Sandy. There's no compensation for subsidizing it. I go to Mark. Tell me where the number. Is. I agree. I, I, I we're not interested in subsidizing Sandy, and and that's that's why I did the analysis that I did. Right. So they they have three stations, but we're only going to staff one um, with with career paid staff, right? And we'll staff them with a three person engine and a two person 
rescue rescue type six lighter resource a two person lighter resource that's only staffed 12 hours a day right so um so that's that's the the staffing that we'll provide right on top of that they staff currently um they have a minimum staffing of, of three on their end of, right they're also spending um over six hundred thousand dollars paying us to operate station 18. Right, so we need to take that into account. Realize that when they become, <clears throat> when when they enter this contract for service, that's going to be lost revenue to us. So I take that and in, that into account. Um, we would also need to continue to pay for some of their professional services, utilities, auditing, some of their board costs. So all of those costs are built in. They would come onto our um, insurance plan, both for health insurance and liability insurance. So I try to take all those costs into consideration, um, and then. The, the revenue sources is their assessed valuation, um, which is um, currently can, can cover all of those costs. Um, and we still expect a cushion uh, that will allow um, some flexibility, both, both for us, but also to put aside a modest amount into a reserve for them for, for capital replacement going forward, because we will not be um, obviously taking ownership of their, their assets under a, under a contract for service. And so we need to set aside some funds um for for that as well and then just to add to everything that mark spoke to the other two stations that's the volunteer uh piece where we utilize current volunteers it's all wrapped into the to our analysis for what we could provide would not be staffed with uh career personnel at but the other two stations no cost to, to, and it's to all staff those stations it, and it, keep them it is all and the service course. area i mean you can't if you, correct you know because they have a triangle like one yes. two, three yes. and yes the station the first station i'll call it one totally it is what where most of the demand station is. yes but if you're taking over the district you're going to have to cover those areas it's just like at cicada and the georgia globe correct you have to do it all so you can't tell me we're not going to shut the doors on those stations. No, they would be staffed with volunteers, much like we do currently with Station 12 and Station 13. Uh, we would we would staff those stations with with a model that had of volunteers, how we currently do. That's how that's how uh, that's how it would be done for those outlying stations. Well, I think what would be helpful to me, Mark, is when the, if the, if we suggest that we should have a draft contract that in the interest of transparency that the information that you've just conveyed about how how the numbers work out to show that it's cost neutral not that i don't believe you yeah. but you know <laughs> transparency for the taxpayers that yep. that should go out with that contract draft anybody else i agree with you yeah i i just think you know especially at this point you know is we need to know what we're looking at. Yep. So I think the next step is a draft, a draft <laughs> contract. And I, you know, I would want to see Mark's analysis. I'm pretty sure it's pretty in depth because I've noticed he does that. <laughs> uh, so you know, we'll have it right in front of us and we can look at. It. I mean, I I can see where there's going to be some savings because right now they're paying for the chief command staff, the finance department. <clears throat> you know, there's there's a lot of stuff that it, it's where any of these mergers have an opportunity as you're gaining some economies of scale. Um, so you take a look at the numbers, but yeah, I would support going forward with the draft contract and see where it lands. Anybody else? Questions? Comments? Yeah, I Anybody? Just uh, with that being that I'm hearing consensus, uh, I would look towards a, a work session. Uh, Arrow will be sending out from us to the board, likely before the next board meeting, as far as maybe that same day, um, just a little bit earlier if everybody's time works, we'll send out a, a poll, but uh, to walk through <laughs> right, the, con the draft contract that we will have sent to, uh, to Sandy, that way you have eyes on it and we can go through any questions you might have. That'd probably be a good time to go through that analysis. And I like that. And we'll be able to get the um, financials a few days before, like the Thursday. You'll before. have it well before. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, informational items. Office of the Fire Chief. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, since Director Hostel, some of my thunder mine could be shortly, very mm -hmm. short today. Uh, we did have those those two town hall meetings. 
appreciate uh, staff and crews that were there to make those happen. And uh, John in the uh, in the audience here for attending that and asking some of the questions that he asked. We really appreciate the input as well as Jerry. Um, community events, October is a lot of community events for us. Uh, multiple uh, town hall style, as well as just getting the public back in our stations. Um, and uh, as you can see in that picture in that fire chief's report that we submitted uh, pub ed uh, teaching uh, CPR to multiple schools. It's amazing to get back into the schools and 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 do that. They're doing an amazing job. A couple notable events calls. I'm hoping I'm not uh, stealing here from from Chief Huffman, but one of the events I'd, I'd like to speak to is on October 31st. We did have a uh, two alarm uh, commercial fire on Halloween uh, to where crews arrived to a 200 by 100, I believe, uh, commercial building, uh, well involved and had uh, had the fire knocked down in 45 minutes. Did a great job, um, uh, called uh, the second alarm early on arrival. They called that second alarm, uh, which really inhibited uh, some property loss. So just a great job by our crews, uh, shows the excellent work that they do. Um, and that's all I have uh, to the board. Happy to answer any questions. It's something I'd like to kind of add. Um, the OFDDA conference, um, the Office of State Fire Marshals did a, a presentation on wildfires and how much acres they burned um, yeah, over the last few um, decades and show how they're getting worse and worse. And Chief Brown and his staff has added that to their presentation. Um, you want me to speak to it? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Go so uh, really the data in, in Maryland, as you attended both, you saw the differences in, in the uh, in both presentations, but uh, from 1991 to, uh, sorry, sorry, 1992 to 2001, uh, there was roughly 170,000 acres. Give, give me about 15 to 18, I, I can't remember if it was 170 or 188 mm -hmm. off the top of my head, uh, <clears throat> as far as annual acres burned across the state. Uh, fast forward the next 10 years from 02 to 2011, there was an average of 360,000 acres that were uh, burned annually across the state. Then you fast forward to the, to the next 10 years. So basically from 2012 to 2021, there were 760,000 acres annually uh, in the state of Oregon. Projections for the next 10 years are obviously, if they, if they continue along the trend that they've been, we're looking at 1.4 to 1.5 million acres on the landscape. The interesting thing is, 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 as you look at the Northern California weather pattern, you can see from 30 years ago till now, this, this progression north of, of a weather pattern. And if you look at the, the fires from Northern California to, uh, to Southern Washington, it is a swath of fires in this map that is, is running straight up the center of, of the state encompassing, uh, Clackamas County. And, and so it is a, a, a visual that is eerie. Mm -hmm. uh, it's data that, that shows that the wildfires on the horizon, they're not a, a fluke. This is a weather pattern shift, weather pattern change, our fuel moisture uh, content. We're in a 10 year drought. All of these things are, are lining in for a, just a, a new way and a new preparation and a new risk for. Uh, the state of Oregon, as well as our local area. And Chief, uh, Chief Brown and I were looking at this the Thank other day. You. That's a great. Yeah, there's uh, Chief Brown and I were looking at this the other day, and we were like, uh, like our county is bracketed on two sides of fires that have burned around us in the past, and to some degree, of, we go to the, to the 2020. That's that's 30 years ago, years ago, and then go to the next one. That's current. And if you just look at that, that swath in the lower left hand, Marilyn, you see the unshaded area. Mm -hmm. And then you look your way up to the to the northern uh, part, southern Washington. That's the swath I'm talking about from that lower left corner all the way up to the top center, that that uh, that swath of, of, of fire that's on the landscape. It's. Uh, it's pretty eerie. It's eerie. It is eerie. But. Uh, state's doing some good things with Senate Bill 762. We've got a lot of involvement, uh, but preparation is, is imperative for us moving forward. Thomas, did you have your, your hand up? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> uh, Nick, in the past, I did 
request in our CPR hands-on training classes when we go into the schools, I would like to suggest we include Christ the King Elementary, I mean Elementary and Middle School as well as LaSalle. Are we doing that? I'm sorry, Thomas. I missed that. Can I, turn his volume up a little? I missed the last piece. I, I couldn't hear. Uh, LaSalle High School and Christ the King Middle School and High Elementary School are part of our in our community. And when we're doing this um, CPR classes in schools, I don't, I'm not sure if they are included. Uh, uh, Chief Whiteley is on the meeting. Um, and so he's 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 heard what you what you said right there. And so we'll just do a follow-up, we'll do a return report uh, either oh, next oh. meeting. Okay. Or, also, Saint John's the Baptist, okay, right, Saint John's the Baptist, Christ the King, and LaSalle. We'll do yes. a follow up to, to let you know what kind of interaction we have with those Correct. schools and Correct. and the, the situation. Either at the next board, or or more likely, Chief Whiteley will go direct with you That's uh, right. to answer that. Unless, thank uh, you, Marilyn. You see that as being a question. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Anything else, Thomas? No. Thank you. Jim? <clears throat> No, anybody? Okay. Um, Assistant uh, Chief Stewart will give an update on the Office of Strategic Services. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a few items to touch on. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the board uh, for responding to and, and tackling the SDAO insurance credit mm -hmm. training. Um, and I know a couple of people, I think we, Chris Haas also signed up for the academy, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, so the survey is complete, uh, reflects our full 10% discount, uh, which is also what we budget upon. So that's that's an important piece that we would accomplish that. Uh, and they do change the requirements annually. Uh, they do look for that kind of ongoing growth. So as those come out, we'll certainly inform the board and make sure we're on track uh, and ahead of that uh, next year. Uh, and speaking of next year, if uh, you are not aware, the SDAO conference is the first week, second week of February, the 9th through the 12th. Um, so there will be educational opportunities during this event. Uh, from the strategic plan piece, if you noticed on your uh, fire chief's report, there's a small change on the back side, uh, top right corner, as uh, a small pie chart, which reflects our goals uh, for the district for a strategic plan. Um, you'll see that uh, we've completed one. Uh, we've got a, a few that are late uh, for various reasons, some that are in progress, and a few that have not. Uh, launched yet. Um, but the intent of putting this here as well as our website is to increase the transparency and accountability of, of staff uh, and the fire district to the board and to the community and to the members uh, that serve with us. Uh, so you'll see that on an ongoing basis. Uh, and we expect to see more green tick along as the day goes by. Um, so you'll have that there uh, just to reflect upon and uh, feel free to ask questions uh, as part of that. And then under technology services, uh, two pieces. Uh, so you approved the tough book purchase uh, tonight, which our reseller really appreciated because those actually, despite all the delays, finally shipped and have been received by logistics. So uh, they will be happy to know that we uh, are able to pay for those. And then uh, operations identified a connectivity challenge with uh, the apparatus in station 19. There's just a dead spot of Verizon coverage. So we worked with our vendor, uh, Cradle Point, who does our uh, connection pieces for the apparatus, and they have sent us a dual modem uh, unit that uh, we'll be working with Fleet to get installed, and we'll be using, uh, for now, Verizon, as well as testing uh, a FirstNet card or SIM card in there, hopefully to, to reduce that dead spot. Uh, then lastly, uh, and I'll leave it for uh, Chief Huffman to touch really on facilities, but uh, the Station 22 Gladstone Fire Station, is the remodel is complete and the crew moved in on Saturday. Mm, yeah. So they're going to respond now for the last couple of days. End of report. Questions for Chief Stewart? No? Okay. Assistant Chief Dieter will give an update from the Office of Business Service. Thank you, members of the board. So tonight you. you'll hear an update from Health and Safety Chief Heather Goodrich. And then after that will be an update from Community Services uh, Division Chief Doug Whiteley. So turn it over to, I believe, Heather first. 
Good evening, board members. Can you hear me? I've been having some issues here. Yep. Here okay, great. So it's nice to see all of you, even if it's remote. Uh, Chief Brown asked me to give you an update on our wellness program. And since I don't uh, give you an annual update any longer, I just wanted to briefly touch on the highlights from 2022 and give you some examples of things we're looking forward to in 2023. So for 2022, uh, we are still 100% compliance for our physicals, which may not seem like a lot, um, but we're one of the few departments that actually is 100% compliant um, with COVID. Many departments had to pause their services, and just like everywhere else, healthcare is having a hard time finding people to work for them, and the occupational medicine uh, clinics are not immune to that either, so um, we have been finding it's more difficult to get our members in, and I've been talking to other departments that have had issues with it as well, but we are 100% compliant, and so that is a highlight for us. Um, another one is that we resumed our on-site group activities. Um, we had to stop those during COVID, and the two main ones are our group fitness testing. We were able to partner with Station 10 during their respiratory mask fit testing, um, and we actually got 155 of our 250 career firefighters partially tested, which may not sound like a lot, but it is a lot to go out to each station and test everybody individually. So we always appreciate our partnership. Um, and we got back on track with that. Um, we also have gotten back on site for wellness talks. That's kind of the bread and butter of our program. Um, we have done three wellness talks this year. Alicia did two and she saw all the crews. Um, I was able to hit about 65% of the crews. So we uh, combined it 152 visits this year. Um, another highlight is that we've made a concerted effort to provide more feedback to our firefighters in a variety of ways. So the first one is at our pre-physical test, we added a 10-year risk score, um, and that identifies members that are at higher risk of heart disease. So we take their lipids, their vitals, and different health information, and we put it into a risk calculator. Uh, if a firefighter has a 10-year risk of 5% or greater, then we have signed a contract with Reyes Radiology. Uh, they used to be Epic Imaging, and they're located in Happy Valley. And we will send our member in for a coronary artery calcium score. Um, this score measures the amount of calcified plaque in the coronary arteries. So those results will be sent to our occupational medicine physician, and then the individual will get them during their annual physical. So that is new this year. Um, as we know, firefighters are at almost two times the risk of cardiovascular disease than the general population. And then when you add personal lifestyle choices, um, their genetics that they get from their parents, and even COVID, um, there's been studies showing that COVID uh, impacts heart health. So with our program, we're always looking at ways to reduce risk. Um, another way that we provided feedback was through one of Alicia's um, on-site wellness talks. It was on metabolic syndrome. Uh, metabolic syndrome is a group of health conditions that puts you at higher risk of heart disease and other related problems. Um, each crew member was given a copy of their individual numbers from their pre-physicals, and they got individual feedback on how they are doing, what their risk is, and how they can make positive changes if they need to. Um, Alicia also worked with a small group of firefighters that are at moderate or high risk for their LDL cholesterol, and LDL is the bad type of cholesterol. So we're trying to do more outreach versus just doing the testing. Um, for injury prevention and rehabilitation, uh, we added a balance screen. Um, we started it with our recruits prior to the academy and gave them information on how to improve balance and decrease the risk of injury. So those are just some of the highlights from 2022. Um, as for what's coming in 2023, uh, we are looking into deeper cardiac testing that we can do through our contracted lab. Um, it would provide increased feedback to our members and our occupational uh, health physician. Um, there's a deeper lipid test that would show risk before the general cholesterol test, <laughs> something we're looking at. Um, we're also looking at ultrasound testing for not only cardiac, um, which is in addition to the coronary artery calcium scan, but also looking at ultrasound for liver, kidney, thyroid, and groin. Um, it's not currently part of NFPA 1582, which is the standard that we use for our physicals, but it is emerging in fire departments and the International Association of Firefighters, as well as the Oregon State Firefighter Council, is getting more departments involved with it. 
Um, we will be hiring a new athletic trainer. Um, our current athletic trainer, Josh, has accepted a position with Providence Health. Uh, he just told me today, so I'm assuming most of the people on this meeting, this is news to. Um, we wish him the best of luck. He has been great for our program. Um, and as you've heard Jeff Griffin in June, he talked about our workers' compensation renewal. Um, our current mod rate is 0.66, so anything below 1.0 is considered good. And we're actually one of the lowest if not the lowest in the state for our size group. So this athletic training position is essential to getting our firefighters seen very quickly and hopefully keeping them out of the healthcare system, which will um, ultimately reduce their, our workers' compensation and health insurance claims. Um, lastly, we will be providing additional training to a group of our peer supporters. Um, they will learn how to provide specialized support immediately after a traumatic call. Um, I'll give you more information once we're ready to implement, but. I don't get to see you very often, so I thought I would just let you know that that's coming. Um, and I could go on and on with other things that we are doing. Um, I have fantastic staff and they work very hard, but this is just a quick update so that you know what's going on. Um, I also wanted to share that if you didn't know, Alicia and I were also at OFDDA. Um, we presented on the first uh, afternoon and it was on creating or enhancing a wellness program. Um, we've gotten very uh, good feedback from it. We have actually had 13 departments reach out for further resources. So that's just a little update for you. And I'm always happy to answer any questions. Any questions, anybody? I, I have one, uh, Heather. Um, so are you concerned or foreseeing a uh, either a resurgence or an appearance of a variant on the COVID? And if so, what are you anticipating doing about it? Um, we have not seen it in our district. Um, I keep up on Oregon Health Authority and um, everything that comes out with that. So we are prepared to pivot if we need to. Um, we do follow all of the Oregon Health Authority and OSHA guidelines right now, but we always try to put our members' health first. So we are keeping on top of it. Uh, but at this point, we have not seen anything with the new variants. Heather, if I may, I've actually got some information on that from Dr. Judy Multnomah County Great. Oregon Health University. Um, right now, uh, we are in a huge epidemic of RSV for kids. It's the worst RSV uh, uh, kind of epidemic that we've had in years. Uh, there's, it's a huge, it's really bad in Northern California, but it's also pretty bad in our area too. And then the other one, uh, influenza, the, the modeling uh, that we use in the United States comes from Australia. And usually when Australia has a bad, whatever happens in Australia usually happens here in the United States six months later. And we are seeing an exact parallel of uh, influenza that happened in uh, Australia and what's happening here. So this is also one of the worst flu seasons that has been on record in like the last 15 years as well. So um, there you go. It's split this year is RSV for kids and flu for adults is what's, is what's jumping out of everybody. And right now, um, there is a steady, uh, how do I say this, a kind of a steady of the Omicron um, B5 variant that is happening right now, uh, which you know I had a month ago, probably most everybody in this room has had at one point or another. It is it is what it is. It's just kind of our new norm to a large degree. So, you know, so. but right now, uh, talking to Dr. Jude, there's nothing big <clears throat> as of, well, today, uh, when I was with him today, um the on the on the horizon so um. and, then, and speaking are, of influenza um we do have extra flu vaccine so if any of the board members would like to get a flu shot from us um please reach out we're happy to give you one um do you enter into alert too when you give those? absolutely we've been using alert for the last 10 years so okay, perfect yes um, but with COVID, we have seen um, some heart issues with that, with the infection um, actually going on to the arteries. So it's it's definitely, we're doing what we can, but firefighters are at risk. And so we're we're trying to give them all the tools that they, they can. Anybody else? Thank you, Heather. Have Appreciate a happy holiday. You. Thank you, you too. Whitely, next. There Good evening, everybody. I think my screen's blurry. Stand by. Better. Okay. How's everybody doing? Um, I, Steve did not share what I was sharing about, so I appreciate the anticipation and the excitement out there. I'm sure everyone's on pins and needles. So I'm actually going to be talking about <laughs> Operation Santa this evening. 
And there's a slide. The slideshow probably isn't completely necessary, but I do recall from last month, if I didn't use a slideshow, I was gonna be on that humongous screen in front of you guys. So this is merely a distraction for me to be able to talk. Um, so for uh, 2022, we, we're excited to uh, work on Operation Santa. Uh, we have some similarities last year, but also we have some changes in store that um, starts to uh, get a little bit closer to what we originally knew as Operation Santa, uh, though kind of having a newer spin on it. Uh, before I go in too much depth there, I believe he's in the audience there. Uh, Ryan Crogro uh, is working with me on this, though I'm doing the presentation. He's jumped in and has helped me out a ton. Uh, great resource, a lot of great ideas. So I really want to make sure everyone's aware that he is just uh, as much doing doing as much work as I am on this as well. So, um, so a big part here, as you see in front of you, the uh, community parades. This is something we haven't done for a few years. I know there's uh, interest both internal to the organization and from our community uh, to reintroduce some uh, some community parades. So we are doing that this year. Uh, though they do look a little bit different in the past, uh, we kind of roughly shared that this was a possibility. Uh, we bring in back four community parades that uh, we try to do our best to spread those out throughout the community. Um, and when I say four, though, uh, please know that these uh, uh, combine up to probably two parades from previous years. So, uh, for example, I'll get to the more details there, but anybody who's done this before, Oregon City had two pretty large parades in the past, and, and for this one, we're combining those, and I'll let you know how we're hoping to make that happen. So uh, with the parades, uh, we are moving away from the donation pickup during the parades, uh, and we're going to continue the drop-off events that we've had the last couple years. Uh, we're hoping this is successful. I know this is a big change in the parades from previous years. Uh, we really worked hard to try to advertise that information uh, that, that involves our website, social media, uh, information when people go to check our maps. It also provides a, a clear message that there will not be donation pickup uh, during the parades. I, I do anticipate there will be some because there's such a rich history there, and uh, and we will do our uh, do work to accommodate that and, and try not to leave anybody uh, frustrated and upset. So. Uh, but overall, the goal is to have a community parade that can uh, go throughout the neighborhoods, essentially advertising the drop off events, but also uh, kind of what everybody really enjoyed was the parades uh, with the fire apparatus going through the community and with Santa waving from the apparatus, is what, which is what we'll be doing. As I noted, there's four of those uh, spread throughout. And roughly the idea there is with the parade. Uh, is it is advertising uh, a drop-off event within the next several days. Uh, we weren't able to uh, really do the very next day other than one time just because of the nature of how this is set up. Uh, though there's also five drop-off events, like I said, so that makes a total of nine events over 12 days. Uh, so doing them uh, back-to-back -back wasn't always going to work, but we're, they're within a, a couple days of each other from the parade uh, <clears throat> then to the drop-off event. So as you see here, we uh, I say kick off, but uh, really a lot of November has been devoted to Operation Santa. But so we kick off our the outward portion, the community portion next Wednesday, November 30th uh, with uh, the Oregon City Parade. Uh, then the next night is the Happy Valley Parade. Uh, the following Tuesday is a Clackamas Parade. And then two days after that, which is Thursday, is a Milwaukee Parade. Ariel, if you want to jump to the next slide there. And, and these kind of help advertise and coincide with these five drop-off events. These are the same uh, locations and essentially the same day as last year. Obviously, the date is one different because the way the year lands out. But it is a Saturday, Sunday, Wednesday, and Saturday, Sunday. Uh, so the idea with this, as we get those uh, donations, uh, the fire district, as we had <laughs> last year's, we are not going to be hosting a warehouse. Uh, because we've established such great community partners who uh, really I kind of are professionals in doing this and they and they distribute donated goods throughout the year. Uh, majority of our donated supplies are going to the Clackamas Service Center, which we did last year. And then one of the events will be going to the Amen Group and they're out of Clackamas area there. Uh, they've been awesome partners. Uh, we're doing our best to kind of work closely with them and, and make this continue to, continually to be successful. Uh, so at the end of the each drop-off event, uh, uh, staff and volunteers will take all those donated goods directly to whatever partner we have for that event. 
get the uh, trucks and everything ready, refueled for the next event, and then go from there. Um, our goals with that last event being December 11th, and like last year, use that following week to really wrap up a lot of loose ends, and um, hopefully uh, have a good final report for you when we come see you again in January. Happy to answer any questions. Doug? Yeah. What was the last group you mentioned after the Clackamas Service Center? Yeah, it's the AMEN group. And I apologize. AMEN, I believe, is an, it's an acronym. And I apologize. I don't remember what that stands for. Their focus, uh, they're out of Clackamas there, and they focus on... Where in Clackamas? Uh, I, I believe off of Jennifer or Caps Road, one of those two. Oh. And uh, a lot of their focus uh, is uh, veterans uh, with families and needs that are veterans. I see. Military something. Yeah. It's... Yeah. Oh. American Military Encouragement Encouragement Network. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. Appreciate that. All right. Any other questions for Chief Wiley? Ryan, did you want to say anything now or wait for your report? Uh, I'll wait. All right. Thank you very much, Chief. Chief, uh, Chief Financial Officer Whitaker will now give an update from the Office of Financial Services. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Um, first, I'll start off. I think it was in the, the fire chief report, but um, as I'm sure many of you heard, we were the victims of a um, phishing and ACH fraud um, attempt um, last month. And so I just want to thank uh, both Michael and Christina, um, whose quick action made it so that we were able to recover all of those funds um, without any losses. Um, so, and then also just um, Thank uh, SDAO and our, our insurance agents. They were they were on top of it as well and getting us resources and, and all of that. So we've we've implemented some some changes to our finance procedures to prevent that in the future. And we'll also be implementing some some IT security upgrades as well um, to to prevent that. Um, so uh, feel uh, good about the outcome, but but bad that we were put in that situation. So we want to make some changes to make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, second thing, just to mention, is JJ, have, I'm on a meeting. Oh, okay. I'm just checking in. Um, <laughs> you're not muted. You're not muted. <laughs> uh, we have continued to work uh, with the auditor. So our new auditor this year was on site again um, earlier this month. Um, so that's their their second site visit. So really appreciate their diligence and and looking at our our books. Um, because this is their first year with us, and because we're kind of last in line as one of their new clients. It's it's likely the last for an extension past the this December thirty first deadline. Uh, shouldn't be long after that, so we'll we'll keep you updated on whether they'll be able to present their their findings at the January or, or February meeting of the, of the board. So appreciate your, your patience on that. It is it is going well. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention is the finance report, per usual, um, is in your board packet. It starts on page nineteen. Um, Couple things to highlight on that. On on the second page, as as usual, is our is our cash um, balance. And so once again this year, we we came close, uh, but we we had enough cash to, to get through without having to borrow from the tax anticipation notes. Um, so we we saved some interest costs there. Um, the balance was was a little bit under uh, one million, um, but but I felt comfortable uh, not having to, to draw on those funds. Um, and then, very exciting, I did add a fourth page to the finance report uh, this month, uh, just with, with a few extra extra charts. Um, one I think I talked about last month, which is just the, the new PERS rates, um, which will take effect uh, July 1st. And so there's, there's some increases there in our, in our cost across all three tiers. Um, the second chart there shows some of the, the interest rates uh, that we're currently uh, seeing. Um, and so I would highlight the, the orange and blue lines up there are the current treasury rates, um, which are hovering just around 4% and upwards. And then our most of our savings are typically in the, the LDIP, which is the green line there and is, is steadily increasing. Um, it's at 2.8% right now. And then the, the gray line there is what we assumed in the, what I assumed in the budget, which was a 1.2% interest rate. Um, so we'll have some some gains there compared to what I budgeted, just because interest rates have, have continued to rise, and I've um, I estimated it conservatively. Uh, starting today, um, I put in an order to move um, roughly twenty million dollars into short-term treasury bills, 
Um, so we'll be earning um, four percent on those, up four to four point four percent on those, rather than the two point eight percent in the LGIP, and so that will um, net us an additional fifty to one hundred thousand um, dollars, depending on how quickly the, the LGIP rate rises to to cash those those treasuries. <coughs> And then the last chart there just shows um, some of the impacts of inflation. This is actually um, one that we prepared quite well for, um, where we had our we had estimated for the year we budgeted fuel diesel fuel at, at four dollars and seventy nine cents a gallon, and as you can see, it's it's hovered around that, been a little bit below that. So so that's one area where I think inflation didn't catch us by surprise, but there are other areas in the budget, particularly on the utilities, um, where we might see some. Um, over expenditures, um, you know, North of Natural just raised their rates 14%. They're going to raise them 14% again in the spring. Um, we we didn't plan for that, so um, so we're keeping an eye on 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 inflation and and how it's uh, changing our our purchasing power. Um, I think that's it for me. Um, unless there's any questions. So you obviously did a good job of budgeting price per gallon, but you did you go do a good job of. Um, Guessing how many calls we've run and how much the engines are actually right. running. Right. There's a second piece of that, which is, yeah, did we did we do a job, good job of seeing how much fuel we're actually using? Exactly. Um, and and so far, yeah, we we are within budget, but but that's definitely the, the second big piece there. I, I had, you know, and it might be an answer that Nick will have to mark, but I did. I'm watching the overtime. We're at 42.4, 33% of the weight of the year, which is we're 28% over a burn rate than we'd expect to see. Do we know why? Yes. Um, there's a couple of reasons. Um, the, the first is um, lead usage is, is higher than I estimated it would be in, in the adopted budget. Um, the number of, of floaters that we have available to cover ships is lower than I estimated in the budget, given where we are now due to, to attrition and, and some staff movement. And I think probably the third reason is that I need to rethink how I'm budgeting over time. I'm probably um, underestimated it this year and need, need to revisit that and um, think about but but even more in that that category and, and treat it more as a, a worst piece scenario than than kind of the the middle that I was I was looking at. So um. I do want to add a little bit to it, Mark, because you don't give yourself enough credit. Um, as always, he's a humble guy. But uh, we also have conflagration money that is comes out of off replacement, the overtime that we will be getting reimbursed, um, which that money goes right back into bridging that gap. Um, and this is a a job where we get a lot of injuries either <laughs> on the job or off. And right now we have a very high level of people off that are injured. And um, some of these injuries are not forecasted, whether it's mm -hmm. heart attack or getting hurt uh, in recreational sports off the job. So that all drives to overtime. That you, that you can't truly budget for you can't you know so you you play this this game of best guesstimate mark is pretty darn close you know to give himself enough credit but this is just a couple unfortunate there okay uh, but i would i would say it's 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 trending high um and you know that's that's where some of the things i mentioned like the the extra interest earnings that we're going to get the reimbursement from the the conflagrations um the property tax coming in higher than we estimated. So those those revenues will hopefully be used to offset that increase. So we're still able to to stay within budget. Um, but it's it's definitely trending too high at the moment. So you said something about um, not our floater pool being hit obviously because of attrition and stuff. So that kind of means our there's some give there when it comes to this non-overtime salary as well. So <clears throat> Yeah, there's there's some salary savings from, from, from vacancies compared to what we're about to be as well. Yeah. I have the same concern that uh, Chris raised, and um, Mark points it out. You need to deal with it <laughs> because he can't control that. And, and every year we budget more for overtime, and it's never enough. So I don't know what the solution is or if there is one. But um, we've got strategies in play, Marilyn, that that uh, will will help us in that. Um, <laughs> we have an academy of 15 right now. They're just not 
ready to go. And so all of that will, will help. Um, there is going to be overtime. We all know that in the fire service. That's the nature of working a 24 hour shift. But uh, we do have strategies that are put in play with, again, having eight people off at the same time for injuries affects that strategy, you know? So uh, we try to forecast and, and we have a good strategy in play. It's just being able to see it come to fruition for once would be great. I will say, Mark, um, you know, the fraudsters are getting, just they're everywhere, they're in everything. And I would commend you, as I understand how it unfolded, that your staff felt comfortable enough with you and confident in you that when it didn't seem right to them, they didn't, you know, quit that finger on what's wrong here. They felt okay to come up the line and Michael into you and say, hey, this is a little hanky. I don't know if it's what it should be. And I think that that it shows, demonstrates that you uh, have your staff are, are working as the team that, um, yeah, that the chief is looking for in all of his departments. So. I think you're going to be commended for that. Thank you. Yeah, the, the it, process works. For you know, those that weren't aware, like the, the payment went out overnight, and that probably 7 15 the next morning, I had staff in my office being like, I think, I think something's wrong here. And we were able to, to stop that payment within a few yeah. hours of doing that. And they didn't just step back and say, Well, it's not my problem. <laughs> uh, yep. So, anybody else? What board members? From our, okay. Thank you. Okay, Division Chief Huffman will give an update for the Office of Emergency Services. Thank you, Madam President and Directors. Um, as we were reflecting on some of these injuries um, and the busyness of some of the calls they've been on, uh, it's been significantly busy over the last few months. And the last few weeks uh, continued that trend. <clears throat> and uh, there was a stop, uh, some of the calls that are notable listed in your packet. There was a stovetop fire at Sandy Heights Apartments, which uh, kind of emphasized uh, suppression systems and their value in the district uh, and, and the neighboring areas. There was a significant water rescue in uh, Austin Hot Springs, uh, mostly because they were stranded for almost 24 hours and it was super cold. And so uh, getting them out of that situation from the rescuers' point of view was a fairly easy operation. They were really well trained in their operation. but the people that were trapped had a big risk, you know, so that, that was a really um, interesting call. Um, and we've had a couple of residential fires, uh, specifically on Halloween. <clears throat> the chief mentioned the commercial fire, but earlier that day, they had a residential fire that was significant. So they had a couple of working fires in the same shift. Uh, so that's, uh, that just shows the risk that all the crews are going to, and, and that's seen a trend the last few months and how busy it is. I think that goes hand in hand with all the other trends and of calls. So it's a, it's been busy and the operation crews have been doing really well. Um, the only other thing operationally, and this is kind of related, is well, we had a really good week last week and we chose two new training captains, uh, Steve Sakaguchi and Isla Borders from Cornelius Fire uh, were offered positions uh, for training captain. And related to that, the EMS captain was chosen, just Justin Colvin. Uh, we're all super excited for all three of them. And uh, the ops group and training got together and are going to start to strategize and get some help and move forward with all the training of the academy and, and everybody else. So super happy about that. Um, and then a, a facilities note, the chief steward mentioned, really the um, the milestone was Gladstone for facilities, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, that station was never designed for 24 hour occupation, you know, or and it's it's um it's not ideal, but it's it's going to provide a really good level of service for not only the city of Gladstone but all the district by having that 24 hour seven in the station. And just moving out from across the street is going to save response times. <laughs> so there are some logistical hurdles we still have to get over with with uh, delays and ship, shipping of the furniture, but we'll we'll work it out as we fully equipped the station, but they're in it operating now. Uh, if you have any questions for either area. Question for Chief Buffman. No way? Thank you. Okay, professional firefighters of Clarkmouth County, local 1159, shop steward Andrew Gord. Um, he is on shift oh, tonight, and I think they got a call. Probably so. got a call. Yeah, 
Um, no, so he do. emailed me and let me know that he was here next month. Okay, good, and he good. got a call. So good. Okay. Well, good. We don't want to. We want him doing what he's supposed to do. Okay. Sure he's going to pick doing his job over talking to us. Yeah, Faye. Mm. <laughs> All right. Volunteer Association report from the Volunteer Coordinator Ryan Figaro and President Jerry Carr. Madam President, uh, members of the board, I want to thank you for uh, this opportunity to present. It's fun to be back here uh, in this new role as uh, the volunteer coordinator and trainer. Just want to share with you at Station 12, we did about 60 percent, uh, 20 out of 31. Station 13, we had zero coverage there. Station 21, which is where our rehab <laughs> units and support personnel run out of, 10 out of 31 nights or about 30 percent uh, covered. And then they're augmented by another 11 nights by at home response uh, by additional support personnel. Uh, I think it's up to about 60%. Um, it's real, I want to share about that. But those are crummy numbers. I mean, I, what, what we're struggling with is we've created a volunteer program that has produced some stellar people, and a bunch of them are in our academy here, a bunch of them are on the line here. And some have gone to other agencies, and we're just struggling with numbers right now. We have a new academy that's going to start in January, and uh, and that should bump our numbers. But it takes a while, just like on the career side, to get those guys or those people out uh, on the street, actually pulling shifts and, and helping out. So we're working to improve that. Sixty percent isn't a passing grade in my mind, and I, and I understand what I'm walking into. Uh, as far as drills, did some interesting stuff. Water mapping. That's basically figuring out if you shoot the hose up in the ceiling and knock it down and watch it rain down the wall, kind of drain off the back wall. That's a good way to cool the, the hot air gases that are up top. And, and they kind of instructed the guys about that and then how you move into a structure and then you kind of shoot it off the walls, off the ceiling to kind of cool the gases so you can continue to move forward to the seat of the fire and then put the fire out. So that's that's a fun drill that was done before I was there, uh, which I wish I was there for that. <laughs> I like that stuff. Uh, and then October for career staff and volunteers, hey, getting ready for winter, and eventually we're going to be responding to snow and ice. So we practiced putting on uh, tire chains and kind of went through that that experience uh, so that you can be know how to chain up the brush rigs or an engine and, uh, and, and how to respond in those environments and make sure you have the equipment before it actually gets uh, snowy out there. Then EMS, we did traumatic brain injury, musculoskeletal spinal injuries. And then uh, at the end of the month, we did fire attack, and uh, and that's that's fun stuff. And then I'll let the President Kearney share about the community involvement. So are there any questions for me? Before I sit down. Can I just say just one real quick with what Ryan spoke to? This academy that we have going out right now has 50, about fifty percent are from the volunteer ranks. Seven out of the fifteen wow. that we that we brought on are from the volunteer ranks. <laughs> that doesn't mention what Twelfth and Valley's fire chief called me and how many he took from our ranks as well as Gresham and city of Portland. So um, we have a lot of our volunteers got career jobs this year. Okay. Anybody have questions? Right. Thank you. Jerry, you're on. Thank you. Jim had a question. I have oh, to I'm echo sorry. what Brian I'm said. It really is. Jim had a question. Sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize, Jim. Oh, that's okay. Um, no, just a comment. Uh, I wasn't aware that the volunteer coordinator process had completed. I knew it was going on, but uh, thank you, Chief. I think it's an important position in the department. So thank you for uh, your commitment in filling that. And congratulations, Ryan, in the position. You're a perfect person to be in that role. So just wanted to mention that. Thank you very much. Sorry, Jim. Okay. Sorry, Jerry, now. Okay. Uh, I want to echo what Brian said. It really is great uh, to be back here and looking you in the eye instead of on the screen uh, and hearing what you can say. For me, that's a big deal. Uh, <laughs> the, um, as from the volunteer standpoint, uh, from a community involvement, what we did this. Uh, in October was at uh, Station 18. We had a uh, Halloween party for the residents of that area. Uh, 
in some cases, a, a child can go out and go, you know, trick or treat and then walk a half a mile to the next house. Uh, instead, we brought them into the station. Uh, we had uh, chili dogs, we had uh, candy, we had uh, fire prevention discussions, we had uh, demonstrations of what was happening on the apparatus, uh, both by volunteers and the career staff, which joined in uh, to help. Uh, it was something that we did in the past. Uh, hopefully, uh, this will be the rekindling of uh, where we are. Now, this next part is something that uh, I've been asked to do. Uh, Jack Tans uh, does an awful lot of work in uh, Milwaukee with uh, the CERT program. Uh, this past month, he had uh, eight events plus a presentation to the uh, I'll get this right. Milwaukee Public Safety uh, uh, Committee on Clackamas Fire District talking points. Uh, Chief Whiteley is the one that asked him to do this, and Jackson Wind to continue to do it. I think he deserves a patent back for that, and I wanted to let you folks know about it. If you have any questions, please feel free. If you don't, I'll sit. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. <clears throat> okay. All right. Um, everybody has their correspondence and informational items. Were there any comments anybody want to make on those? Marilyn? Yes, tell me. Just a little housekeeping. This is information for Chief Brown and Ariel. We need to bring our tradition back since we are meeting in person, we have to keep it personalized, building working relationship. Our own CFO celebrated a birthday last Saturday. I didn't hear anybody talking about that or a cake. What happened to that? Well, because we bought a cake for Jay and his upcoming birthday. <laughs> Mark, so your funds Mark, were exhausted. First day was chopped liver. We got the upcoming birthday, so we have a cake for Jay. Oh, okay. He can, Mark will have one of the cupcakes for it. Yeah, oh, yeah, we can save that. Wonderful. Hey, Mark, you make sure you get half of that cake from Jay. <laughs> Thomas, since you're not here, we'll give him your cupcake. <laughs> <laughs> you got a cupcake? I would have come, even if I'm not feeling well. A personal cake. Cupcake. Oh, personal cake. Okay. Everybody got their personal cake. Okay, Jay. I'm looking forward to seeing. Are you done, Thomas? <laughs> yes, yes, done. Well, thank, you. Done. thank you, Marilyn. Okay. The next board of directors meeting is on Monday, December 19th, 2022 at 5 p.m. The meeting will be hybrid with the public invited to attend either by remote video conferencing or in person here at Station 5. So um, with that, on behalf of board of directors, I wish everyone a happy holiday this Thursday. And as Keith Brown wants to say, this is a um, all hazards emergency services uh, organization. We're 24 7, 365, 66. And so we will have crews working on Thursday, to which we say thank you for your service and be safe. Thank you for doing that. Meeting is adjourned at 6.53. Absolutely love you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Good night, Jim.